I did this for Final Fantasy 9, so I figured I'd do it for 7. Now, I grew up watching 7. 7 was... Final Fantasy 7 was released to the United States when I was 2, yet it was in Japan when I was 1 year old. And... I wouldn't call it my childhood game, because I didn't pick up and actually start playing it until the summer of 06 and then after I was done estimating my dad and my cousin's house it wasn't until 2012 that I picked it up again and played it all the way through for my senior year of course and it was actually a very cool game I will admit that like I consider Kingdom Hearts to be my childhood game Yet, you already know I caused a lot of controversy with that Why Kingdom Hearts Sucks video. The reason Final Fantasy VII isn't considered my childhood game was because with Kingdom Hearts, I was six years old. I me and my best friend were, every time we were hanging out back when we lived next door or even afterwards when he kind of moved away, we were always playing that game together. It was what epitomized our friendship for a time. Both of our favorite games. It was awesome. It was like... I wasn't a big Disney fan, I'll be honest. I liked Tarzan. Well, I was the only Disney film I saw all the way through. I was kind of cool with The Lion King. I heard it was badass. Lion King was big at the time. 90s, of course, but other than that, Disney, all I saw Disney as was the Mickey Mouse Company. Final Fantasy, however, that was my shit. But anyway, with 7, 1997, this is a game that I always watch my dad or my cousin play. Sort of my mentor figure. I would vicariously, like, live through experiences from them. Final Fantasy 7 would plague me in my dreams many years later possibly to this day if I didn't beat it but it's cool it belongs there really almost as a curse but a little better gameplay elements wise Final Fantasy 7 is kinda cool for me because you had materia system, so you could really customize a party to do a lot of things. You can sort of affect the command gauge, which will ultimately give him somewhat of a class. Give him black magic, white magic. In fact, there isn't really this black and white dichotomy with Final Fantasy VII. The color spectrum really affects the materia. Limit breaks took another level. We kind of became more layered. Although weapon customization became ridiculously simple. I disliked that. And even though you can really customize a lot of characters, there is a little bit of uniqueness to everyone because of the limit break. I kind of see Aerith as a mage. I see Sid as being a Dragoon or a Lancer like Kane from Final Fantasy 4. I see Chief as being a monk because she goes bare knuckle basically. Well, she has the gloves on, but you get the picture. Yuffie's obviously the ninja class, but... I see their classes and what they're supposed to represent. At the same time, there's just so much avenue that they're all roughly the same character in terms of the gameplay perspective. The biggest difference is just who is ranged and who isn't ranged. Who can hit hard and who can't hit hard. And ultimately, that's why nobody likes Kate Sif. Storyline-wise, I kind of like what they were going with it from this game on Final Fantasy 
went from just being this storyline that kind of combined elements of Star Wars and Miyazaki films to having somewhat of a spiritual mythology and concept to each game with the idea of Gaia and the fact that death really is you returning to the earth and becoming fuel for the planet. I like when video games take on a very philosophical, very almost existential niche. And the Final Fantasy series can cover it in many ways, with seven many ways. With seven it kinda of covers a very bright, optimistic thing. Livestream can do anything. I mean livestream kinda of saves them in the end. Except they kinda of give you a guess what ending to sort of give you whatever interpretation you want, but Advent Children completely ruins that. And I like that as opposed to Nine because Nine cover a lot of themes of sibling rivalry and nihilism, so it was somewhat darker even though it looked much more immature in a visual standpoint. It was more of a fairy tale where this looks more like a summer blockbuster. It really does. Midgar, the city you start off with, is really fucking cool. I know they wanted to originally make Final Fantasy VII in New York City. Fuck New York. Midgar is cooler. Eight sectors all in circle together. Honestly, it makes Magnus Santi look like a piss fest. The concept of energy is being used in an interesting way, terrorism, a little bit of left-wing politics, a little bit of right-wing politics kind of infused there, because these are environmentalists going up against an evil de facto corporate government, which I assume is fascist in nature, but at the same time, this isn't a call for democracy, it's an overthrow of a king, which you could consider reaction. Really, Shinra, we already know what Shinra is. Shinra is the corporation that's de facto government, it has a military, it has its own police force. For later games, it has other secret organizations working with it, it has its private goons with in suits. Because sort of like the mercenary with the soap opera esque backstory, you know, the lost memory, thinking he's his best friend, the unrecreated loves, quieted. Oh, fuck, I can't pronounce for shit now. Each character is unique in personality. They may all like. The critics of this game say they're all blank and devoid of character. I disagree. They may not basically be as vibrant as characters in the past, especially Final Fantasy V, but I consider them very fleshed out and interesting. There are things that Barrett will say that won't make sense from a cloud, and there's things Cloud will say that won't make sense for a Yuffie. So, and a lot of the main characters do get some more dimension. Hell, even the minor minor characters do get more dimension. They change their dynamic. And I like that. And basically this year I kind of have bragging rights because I did beat both the super bosses, which is something that I don't think anyone if I carelessly watched played a game ever did. So more bragging rights for me. At hindsight they weren't that difficult and all a lot of other Final Fantasy super bosses that are more challenging, but there you go. And there are two things I need to talk about if we're gonna talk about Final Fantasy, which is Okay, there's one thing I gotta talk about, which is Sephiroth. 
after you first get the flashback sequence, well, actually, once Cloud and the gang get caught up and arrested the first time by Chinra and Co., basically, they they spend the night locked up in the cells of Shinra Manor, or not Shinra Manor, the Shinra Corporation. Once you take that nap, and you wake up, and there's dead soldiers, demons everywhere, and walls covered in blood. The series gradually becomes more and more about Sephiroth, and what kind of a villain he is. People say it's a weird-ass Oedipus complex, that he's essentially some psychotic momless boy. This is all driven by his hatred of mankind. He sees himself as the last of a Citra race. And that uh, he's been lied to his whole life. That he's nothing more than a monster to everybody else. And they see view his mom as the same way. And that he's gonna fucking become God and punish the rest of mankind. I see those as relatable feelings. I know a lot of people that are like that. I mean, he's a bit of a freak about it. And he ends up killing Gareth, which is the second thing you got to talk about. But really, as a villain, Sephiroth is given a lot of style. He has a long, thin Masamune. He has a long flowing L'Oreal hair, wears all black, has a cape, has a final boss theme and a foreboding theme that plays every time he's around for most of the series, that bomb thing. Doom, doom, kind of like Undertaker. Do, do, do. Yeah, I like that shit. And, uh, They give him a lot of cool things, fucking with Cloud's emotions, killing, uh, Nibelheim, everybody Nibelheim, uh, killing Arif. Fucking sending a meteor out to, like, destroy all of mankind and shit like that. They really do build this guy up as a villain. Like... With a lot of RPG villains, I look back at their characters, I wonder why they're villains in the first place. Like, why the fuck did they put them there? They didn't really do anything. Sephiroth, they gave you a reason to hate the guy. And the next thing is Aerith's death. And it's going to conclude my kind of thought on this series, this awesome ass series. I didn't cry when she died. I mean, I saw her death scene when I was seven or eight, and didn't cry. I mean, the music did make it kind of emotional. Over time, I am somewhat warming up to what I'm supposed to feel, but I can't even sulk up. I can't even sob. Mm. Good scene because it is what people think about when they think of Final Fantasy VII. It's like when people think of the Bible, they think Jesus dies. I know I'm just comparing Final Fantasy VII to the Bible, but just sacrifice is a big deal. Human sacrifice, people self-sacrificing for the sake of others, that's a very powerful thing. That's why it's an important scene, because it later comes off as less of a tragedy, more of a symbol of sacrifice. Albeit, is it, was it even worth it? Because Holy didn't do as well as Livestream, but I think she was involved with Livestream as well. I made two reviews of this when I was 13, I both gave them an average score. I take that back, I was a dumbass kid. This is Mr. Rock 7 and SMD.